So thanks to everyone for showing up again for your learning for today, solving quadratic equations. So we will have a quiz next week, just a quick reminder about working with radicals, factoring quadratics, all types, and solving the quadratics using the discriminants. So we're going to learn about that today. Also, factoring quadratics, we saw today how using the quadratic formula can be very useful for factoring when A is not equal to 1. Now, uh, we practiced these already and we factored these ourselves. Some of us use the quadratic formula to factor this one. Others uh, did some mental math and some math gymnastics to factor that one. So these are all the examples that you have already worked on. Now, when we um, factor these, let's graph them. And what, I, what I, my question is, is what's the relationship between the factors and the x-intercepts here? If I put in the, the equation for this one, x squared minus 4x plus 3, graphing that versus desmos, I notice that my plus 3 is my y-intercept for that uh, function. So if I want to know what's the function's initial value or the value of the function at 0, that's always given by c. But what about these numbers, minus 1 and minus 3? What do you notice about that? Oops. What do you notice about the numbers 1 and 3 here? What's the relationship between those factors and the x-intercepts? Here's the x-axis. Oh, intercept, intercept. Looking at this parabola, what's the relationship between these numbers and the x-intercepts? Is it that they're both the same line or not? That they're where here and here? So x minus 1 and x minus 3, if I graph those independently, they would be different lines, but they'd be parallel. And one would have a one would go through that point. It would be a line going up that way, and the other would be a line going that way. That to the problem. Sorry, those lines wouldn't touch. But uh, the interesting thing about those is this number here one and this number here three show up in the zeros of the parabola. I have a root of the of the parabola here at one, and I have a root of the parabola there at three. So together, those two uh, predict the value of those roots. So this is the factored form of the parabola. And I can just remember that when I have the opposite sign number there, this is x minus the value of the root. So minus 3 means the root is positive 3 there. And there minus 1 that means the root is positive 1. Okay. Now, why is that? Well, when I input x as 1 for this parabola, I have 1 minus 1 this Mono, this binomial here becomes 0. So I have 0 times something, which would be 0. And then the other way to create a 0 here is to have x be equal to 3. And that creates another 0. So just a reminder that uh, the factored form predicts the roots. It tells me where that parabola is going to touch the x-axis. Over here, where would you expect to see roots? And would any of them be the same as this parabola? So we might expect to see a root at positive 2 and positive 3. Why did you switch that? Why do we switch the sign? Yeah. Well, uh, one reason is if we remember that this is the factored form and that r and s are the two roots, or I will sometimes write this as r1 and r2, meaning that they're the, the first root and the second root of the parabola, the form includes this negative. I have to, I have to flip the sign of that to find the root. And the reason for that, Jackson, is if I want x minus 3 to be 0, which is by definition like a 0 for that parabola, it will output 0, meaning that its y value will be 0, then x minus 3 needs to be 0. If I use minus 3 for x, I would have minus 3 minus 3 would be minus 6. And I don't have a 0. But if I flip the sign, then I get my 0. So that's why it's a little tricky, but I do want to remember that my factored form, I have to flip these negatives to get zeros. Or if I'm using quadratic formula to find the factored form, then I need to flip these signs, so 3 and 2 thirds. You'll notice 
that when we put those in, we flip the sign negative two thirds and negative three to create the factored form. Okay. So now we might expect a, a zero at minus two, sorry, positive two. The problem with that here is though, is this three is still inside the bracket. So if we were to factor that three out, it would create the proper factored form here because we're not gonna see a, a zero there at positive two. Instead, we see the zero there at two thirds. The reason it's there at two thirds is we found that uh, these two forms of the quadratic were the same. So Rylan, if you take a look at these two, here you would, you would be able to read the root off more easily as positive two thirds. The reason is we need to factor that three out for this form to tell us this information, that A has to be outside. If we bring that A inside, then it becomes a math question, where I say, for that to be a root, this must be equal to zero. So I need some value of x such that 3x minus 2 equals zero. And then I would solve that. I would just be an equation, and I could solve it. So if I have some board space here. Uh, I like leaving that up. Anyway. I would have an equation such that uh, if I told you that f of x is what we have on the board, 3x minus 2 multiplied by x minus 3, and I say what are the zeros to this? Well, either this is 0 or that's 0. So you have a 1, 0 is x minus 3 is 0, so it's x is 3, and we get that just by reading out of the factored form. But another one that we could say that is 0 is equal to 3x minus 2, okay? And this way we could calculate this 0. So to solve an equation like that, I add 2 to both sides because I see here minus 2 and I want to get x alone. So I have 2 is equal to 3x. And then I see I'm multiplying x by 3. So I divide both sides by 3. And then I get 2 thirds equals x. And that's the value of the other 0. People see what I'm what I'm answering there, and why I can't predict from this equation what that root is unless I solve well what makes this zero, what makes that whole thing zero. This number is in the factored form, but it's not in the uh, form that we found that was uh, not fully factored, okay. and that's why we have a root there, not at two but at two thirds. Two thirds is our root. And then with this one, we factored that as a difference of squares. So given that if this is a root, what would you expect the roots to be here? What are gonna be the x-intercepts? Could those two just cancel out each other? This one and that one? Well, if f of x is gonna be zero, one of them has to be zero. Oh. And there are values of x that will make both of them, that would make either of them zero, but they're two different values of x. So we will find two roots here. If we use 2, um, then we'd have 2 times 2 is 4, and 4 minus 3 is not 0. 4 minus 3 is 1. So if I wanted to work that out, what I would do is write down my factors. So I have here 2x minus 3 times 2x plus 3. 2x minus 3 multiplied by 2x plus 3. Okay? And this was my function f of x. Okay, So if I want to know for what values uh, of x do I get the value of the function to be 0, if f of x equals 0, find me x. So this must be 0 or that must be 0. Two options. So we will find two roots. Let's do the work. So 0 is either equal to 2x minus 3. Solve this. What's my first step? If 0 is equal to 2x minus 3, what's my first step to find x? Get x by itself. Yeah, I'm going to isolate x. And so x has two dance partners here. It's being multiplied by 2, and it's having 3 subtracted from it. Which one do you like to move first? Yeah, let's get that negative 3 out of there. How do we do that? Add it to the 0. Yeah, add it to both sides. Yeah. Plus 3, plus 3. 
Good. So now I have a new line. 3 is equal to 2x. Now 2 is multiplying x. So what do I do to get that out of there? Divide both sides by 2. Good. So there's my, an there's my answer. So 3 over 2 is equal to x. Okay. Great. And then I could also have the situation where 0 is equal to 2x plus 3. Maybe this one is the one that's creating a 0 there. Okay. So if that one's the one that's creating a 0, then this would be true. Now I have to subtract 3 from both sides. Gives me negative 3 is equal to 2x. Then when I divide both sides by 2, I get the opposite sign version of that. And that's always going to be the case with a difference of squares, is that the two roots are going to be plus and minus versions of one another with your, with your uh, factors. Now, another thing to note, this is not fully factored form. I do want to take these twos out and see them as an A. Okay, so let's just recap what we had there. We had 4x squared minus 9. That was my original f of x. Yeah, I know. I'm just going to lift it up. 4x minus 9. We factored that into 2x minus 3 multiplied by 2x plus 3. Okay. I could factor a 2 out of that bracket and a 2 out of that bracket. And it would look like this. f of x is equal to 2 multiplied by x minus 3 over 2 multiplied by 2 multiplied by x plus 3 over 2. Okay. And then I would see I have 2 times 2. I just have 4. So f of x equals 4 multiplied by x minus 3 over 2. x plus 3. 3 over 2. Okay. Notice that if I had just used the quadratic formula, I would have found these two roots for this quadratic. And I could just input them here and put my a, which was 4 all along, put my a there. Did that make sense, Cole? Yeah. Good. Okay, that was what I was hoping for. That's why I'm taking a little bit of extra time with this example. Because here, here's x minus one of the roots. Here's x plus one of the roots. This negative 3, 2, that's the one there. Because I have to flip its sign, remember. This positive 3 over 2, that's the one there. Because I have to flip its sign. Wait, wait, you flip its sign, but not the actual value? No, I just, yeah, this, this value, yeah. negative. So it's not the reciprocal or anything. No, no, it's that value. That exact value, but negative goes in there. And... Um, yeah, but in this case, if you made a sign error, it would cancel out because they, they, they alternate signs. Anyway, so that would be the fully factored form of this, this one here. I want to factor these out and then, and then group them so that I get my A out front. And that's a fully factored form there. Okay. So that's why we'll get roots at those values. Um, yeah, let me present. That's why I will get roots at, oop, oop, and my face will be in the way. Nope, there. At three halves and negative three halves, or one and a half and negative one and a half. Okay, so there's one, there's negative one and a half. So that's why we have those roots there. Another thing I notice is that negative nine is the y-intercept of that parabola well down there. And the vertex of this parabola is the y-intercept because this parabola is symmetrical around the y-axis. And in fact, you will find that all difference of squares parabolas will be symmetrical around the y-axis. That's one way that you can create them, uh, is draw a parabola that's on the y-axis. x squared, y equals x squared, is actually y equals x squared minus 0. 0 is the square of 0. So that's why your basic parabola, y equals x squared, is also a difference of squares. But you would never think of it that way, because you're squaring 0. Who cares? So let's keep going. So the solutions to a quadratic equation, they can be referred to as the x-intercepts, the zeros, or roots of the equation. So what are the roots of this equation here? Negative four, zero. Yeah, zero, negative four, negative four, zero. Yeah, these two points are the roots, okay? And so those are called solutions to quadratic equations as well. Okay, they're often thought of as, as very important points along the quadratic. They help us understand it quite a lot. They help us graph it. And in applications questions, the zeros often have a special significance. So, 
When the y value is equal to zero, in other words, this is where the graph crosses the x-axis, yada, yada, those are your x-intercepts, zeros, roots, or solutions. All of these bolded words, you can highlight them all on your page, and remember, they're all roughly synonyms. They're roughly synonyms of one another. All the, all the bolded all the bolded words. When we're talking about quadratic equations, these are synonyms. You'll hear me say roots more often. I like talking about the roots of a quadratic equation, but then I will say, oh yeah, they're the zeros because people think of this as zero on the y-axis. So they are the zeros of the quadratic. X-intercepts is very much describing, this is where the quadratic touches the x-axis. It's another way of saying, when is the quadratic equal to zero? Okay. So let's talk about this one. Determine the exact roots of f of x equals 2x squared minus 12x minus 14. So go ahead and take some time right now on your sheet and work this one out. And then you can take a look at my working it out and we'll compare. I'm going to pause the video. You can pause at home and I'll work it out yourself. So we've been asked to find the exact roots. We can find that with quadratic formula. We can find that by factoring. This is a factorable one. So factoring, probably going to be faster. A uh, quadratic formula will get you there too. Okay, let's take a look. So here's what I've got. You can compare with what you have. And then if you have questions about, hey, how did you get that and I didn't? Oops, sorry. Uh, let's uh, entertain those questions. So Ryland says we should first take out a common factor. She noticed that 14, 12, and 2 all happen to be divisible by 2. So 2 can come out there and we can rewrite it rewrite our trinomial there. x squared minus 6x minus 7, all multiplied by 2 would give us back f of x. So that's correct. Then, how did you factor this one? Yeah, and if two numbers multiply to be a negative number, then one of them has to be negative and one of them has to be positive. So you could put a negative and a positive in right away. And then with 7, there's only two combinations, 7 times negative 1 or negative one or, or negative 7 times 1. Okay, those are the only two combinations because 7 is prime, so it only has 1 in itself as its factors. So then you can see, well, because they add to be a negative number, let's make the bigger one negative. So you have negative 7 times positive 1. That would recreate that. That would recreate that. So this one, so now we haven't answered the question yet. So therefore... The roots of this function, instead of saying this function, I could have wrote the roots of f of x are, what are the roots? x equals and x equals. So what are my roots of this function? Negative 1 and positive 7. Negative 1 and positive 7. Wonderful. Do you remember to switch the signs? So you avoided a common source of error, which would be, Forgetting you saying negative 7 and, pos and, neg and positive 1. No, it's negative 7 because this is minus the root. So minus 7, so just 7. Okay, Minus the root, so plus, so minus minus 1 is what's happening here. That's how we know. Just You just flip the sign, okay? Flip the signs, and then you have the exact roots. All right, now let's take a look at another example together. If I have ones that are not, oops, that are not factorable, then I have to use quadratic formula here. So here's one that is not factorable. So go ahead and use the quadratic formula to find the roots. I will pause while you work it out, and then we will uh, unpause and see the solution together. All right, so let's take a look. And remember that we're looking for exact roots. So we want to leave our answers as radicals. And if we can simplify the radical, so much the better. So I will reveal my solution step by step here quite dramatically. So here we go. Um, so I start with copying up my quadratic formula and having my little table of A, B, and C, which reminds me, well, I had a quadratic that was that had an a of minus 2, a b of 8, and a c of negative 5. So I go ahead and I plug those all in throughout there. So I have negative b plus or minus the square root of b. So 8, negative 8 squared, sorry, 8 squared is 64, minus 4 times a times c. So I have negative, negative, negative. So I am going to be subtracting there. That's still going to be a negative number. 
and then all over two times negative two. Okay. So then I start evaluating. I find that four times two times five is 40. I, it's still negative, so I have minus 40, 64 minus 40, the root of that. Eight over here, plus or minus, and then four, okay? So that works out to negative eight plus or minus the square root of 24 over negative four. Now, how can I simplify that radical to make it a little bit more beautiful, my solution? Divide it all by two. Divide which by two? Uh, yeah, but if I'm going to divide this by two, I have to factor the two out first. And so how do I do that? Julie? Four is two times two times three times three. So you can put out two into three. It's uh, two times two times two times three. Yeah. Because 24 is going to factor as two times two times two times three, or eight times three. You can remember from your times tables. Then you can remember that eight is two cubed. And then you can also see, well, that's also like four times six. And four is a perfect square. So I can bring that out as two because this is like four times four, four times six inside, but the root of four is two. So I can bring that out and create a mixed radical and divide that by negative four. And then I can split this up into two terms and it will look like that. So this would be fully simplified here. Negative eight over negative four is two. Plus or minus two over negative four times root six, well, that would be negative six, negative root six over two, okay? Because two over four is the same thing as just over two. Okay? This negative kind of disappears because it's plus minus, so I had negative already. I was looking at the negative and the positive version of that number already, so this minus for this term doesn't really make a difference. So that would be a fully, fully simplified version. If you got to there, that's very good. If you get to there, that's very, very good. Cool? Wait, no, I was going to ask what happened with 4, but now I see that. The 4 on the bottom? Yeah. Yeah, see, negative 8 divided by 4, that's this. Yeah. And then 2 divided by negative 4, that's that. Where did the negative go? Oh, it's in there. Don't worry. Yeah, it's, it's both. It's both negative and positive. So I got two numbers there. So those are the exact roots of that number. And... Um, Root 6, that's going to be a little bit bigger than 2, but it's going to be smaller than 3. So uh, this number is, both roots are going to be positive. Wait, what did you say? Jonah, it is time for break. So at this point, uh, we'll take a break, and then when we come back, we shall carry on. I just realized that uh, by skipping some steps over here, I may have uh, lost uh, a fair number of you. So let me show you the step I skipped. So... We were working through quadratic uh, formula, and we started with this quadratic that had these traits and came all the way through. And then we found that uh, negative 8 plus or minus 2 times root 6, and 2 times root 6 is a simplification of root 24, because we can take out this perfect square of 4, and the square root of 4 was 2, so that when that comes outside the radical, it goes down to its square root. Um, all over negative four. And then I said, well, that's this then. But I skipped this step, which is this negative four divides both terms. Okay. So this is like X plus one and it's over negative four. So that's the same thing as X over negative four plus negative a quarter. So if I write this out, hopefully that uh, clarifies some things. I have negative eight over negative four plus or minus two root six over negative four. Then I can simplify to here. Okay, negative 8 over negative 4 is 2, and 2 over negative 4 is just 1 half, or 2 times root 6 over negative 4, sorry, here is uh, root 6 over 2. The negative is already inside this plus or minus. I can't be, I don't need plus or minus a negative number, because that's the same thing as plus or minus the same positive number. Like plus or minus 3 is the same thing as plus or minus negative 3. So I don't need to write a negative root 6. It's redundant because it's already inside that plus minus. Okay? And then the other thing that we were missing here was the question asked us to find the roots. So we should tell, we should put in a therefore statement that shows we knew what we were looking for, which were these roots. 
um, two plus root six over two and two minus root six over two would be the two roots of this quadratic. I could use that to input the factored form. I could do lots of stuff with that. And I can also read those values about the quadratic from that. Wait, can you keep it for a oh, sure. Like yeah, this. okay. Yeah, sure, there you go. Okay. All right. And uh, I'll, I'll leave these notes here in case people want to grab them and copy them or grab them and keep them. They go into the recycling otherwise. Okay. So let's go back to the PPT. No point. And boop. Now we're going to look at this uh, application question where h of t, the height of a diver is a function of time. So as time goes forward, we expect this diver to go up into the air and then down. Is this a parabola that opens upwards or open downwards? Is it an umbrella shielding you from rain or a bowl collecting rain? This, this is an umbrella shielding you from rain because A is negative. So that's a good observation. So we know that this is going to look something like that. It's, uh, oh, my video is not on anymore for some reason. But anyway, um, there. Uh, it's going to be something like this. It's going to be a, a, a parabola that goes up and down, actually similar to the one I have on the board behind me. I don't think you were recording when you fixed that X thing on the other page. Like I was, I just was just now, yeah. Oh, yeah. So, oops, we'll go back. So um, we know that this is going to have some kind of shape, all right? And we want to know how long the diver was in the air. And so here, this picture back here is going to really help us understand this. I don't know exactly what this uh, parabola is going to look like, but I know it opens downwards. I know that it's actually sloping upwards at the x-axis from this B. It has a positive slope of 3 and that its y-intercept is 10. So I can create a sketch in my mind right away of what this parabola is going to look like. I can visualize that very quickly if I'm good at reading A, B, and C. So I know that it's going to be rising here. That the vertex is going to be somewhere in the positive, and then it's going to come down and have a zero somewhere over here. All right? And that should really like match what we know about divers and things. If I take my diver and she's standing on the platform 10 meters in the air and then she jumps off, the pen made a parabola towards the desk. And the moment where it hits the desk, the moment where she goes into the water, that's this moment. Another word for that type of moment, that's where the, her height is zero. So if her height is zero, she just hit the water. So if she just hit the water and that's a zero, what's another word for that type of point? It's an x-intercept. It's a root. Yeah. It's a solution. It's a zero of the, of the uh, quadratic. And so I know how to calculate those. Even when I have a really ugly A, B, and C, I can calculate those with a handy tool. What's my handy tool for calculating the roots of a quadratic when I have ugly numbers that don't want to factor? Apply the quadratic formula. So I'm going to pause. We are going to apply the quadratic formula, and people can tell me how long she was in the air. All right, let's carry on, everyone. So we know that she's going to create some kind of parabola with her trajectory. Now, this is not a picture of how she goes through the air. This is a picture of how she goes through time. So our t variable is time. Uh, so she might go straight up and straight down. But you have to imagine the paper moving this way as she goes up and down will draw that longer parabola. So now, um, let's take a look at our handout and the, the work that we've done. So I'll zoom in on that here. Do, 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 do. And minimize my face. Okay, there we go. So, uh, let's take a look. The first thing that I do is I write down my A, my B, and my C. And I wanna just extract that from here, my A, my B, and my C. I create a little table so that it's easy for me. And then I go ahead and substitute into the quadratic formula. When I evaluate, I get negative 3 plus or minus the square root of 205 all over negative 9.8. And I think, hmm, two, 205. I wonder if that has any squares in it. So I do a quick factor tree, and I find that 205, I look at it, it's not divisible by 2 or 3, but it is divisible by 5. So I take out a factor 5, and I find that I am 205 divided by five years old. Uh, this, that's, this is my age. This is prime, that's prime. So there's no squares there. So there's no way I can simplify that radical. 
But I'm also been asked for an amount of time. And if I say she was in the air for root three seconds, you would be like, what are you talking about? No one says root three seconds, Mr. Jennings. Everyone will give me a decimal approximation. Everyone. All right. So this is not an exact answer question. This is a tell me about how long she was in the air question. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to evaluate that. So I know that, t that the times where there are zeros are negative three plus root two over five over negative 9.8. But because the root of 205 is bigger than 3, this would actually give me a negative number. But this one would give me a positive number. Okay, because it's a negative minus a negative divided by a negative. So I can multiply all that by negative 1. And, or sorry, sorry, I can just cancel all of the uh, signs. And that's a positive number. So when I evaluate this one, it's the same thing as t is equal to 1.77 seconds. When I evaluate that, it's 1.77 seconds. Therefore, she was in the air for 1.77 seconds. All right. My picture is I have some kind of parabola like this, right, where she starts here at 10 and goes up and comes down, touches here at this root. This root gives me that point. So this is how long she was in the air, that many seconds. That's when she touches down. The other root is giving me a negative time. When I evaluate this one, if I evaluate that, if I have 3, and I flip the sign of that, and then I'm going to add uh, the root of 205. So I'm going to add the root of that. So then I get this. And then I'm going to divide by 9.8 with the negative 9.8. Then I get negative 1.15. Okay. I'm getting a negative number for time there if I evaluate this, like I told you I would. Negative one second. What the heck does that mean, negative one seconds in this situation? That's this root here. Could that be how long it took her to get up to the 10? Yeah, it's like, if if she not didn't jump at 10, but she kind of flew up and then kept flying, that would be, and, and you called this time zero, that would be when she had to jump off the water to create that. But that's not the way people jump off diving boards, okay? So all of this, so we would say that this is a function where t has a domain of uh, greater than or equal to zero. We wouldn't be interested in values of t that are negative in this function. This is a function we would start at its y-intercept. We would not consider negative values of t. So this root is like basically just an imaginary thing that finishes the parabola. Wait, so if you said that one circle is a positive root, why is there a negative in front of that root? Like, there? how do you know? Oh, it's, no, the other one. This one? Because you They're all negative, right? Root. So it's negative bottom divided by negative top. So I could cancel all these. I didn't want to do that, though, because I thought people would be confused if they saw all these negatives disappear and become positives. But the negatives on top are canceled by the negative on the bottom. So that is positive. You need the positive root because she's... That's going to be the positive right. amount of time after she jumps where she lands. Yeah. So that's using the quadratic equation to solve uh, equations about things moving in space. Here's another one, another example of a toy rocket being launched uh, vertically in height. And so its acceleration is given by this here. Now this one, this question, uh, if we take a look at it, we have h of t equals negative 16 t squared plus 128 t. Okay. So... Those are nicer numbers. Can I factor that? Yeah, I can factor that. All right. Yeah, this is, uh, I could use the quadratic formula. All right. What's the y-intercept of this quadratic? Where would this touch the y-axis? When x is zero. When x is zero, that's right. This has a zero at x equals zero because its y-intercept is the origin because c is zero. So I already know one of the zeros, um, but then uh, if I if I want, I can find the other zero by factoring. But that's not what I've been asked to do. I've been asked to find when will the rocket be 112 feet off the ground. All right. So for that, what I'm doing is I'm saying for what value of t is h of t equal to this. So I have h of t is equal to one, one, two. All right. Now, uh, let's uh, substitute in h of t for that. I would have negative 16 t squared plus 
128t is equal to 112, okay? Because that's h of t. Now, don't be fooled by these t's. I'll do my t's looking very different from the plus sign. Just put like a little hook at the bottom. A little hook Don't at the bottom? Me. Okay, these are t's now. H of t, okay? They look like tj's. Okay, so let's uh, simplify that so that all of the terms are on the same side. All right? Let's uh, s um, subtract 112 from both sides. Now I have negative 16 t squared plus 128 t minus 112 equals zero equals zero all right now what i'm doing is solving for t after how many seconds will the rocket be 112 feet above the ground well there should be some value of time to make this true and that will tell me because this is the function this is the height that i wanted and i've just done some manipulations. Can I factor the 16 out cleanly? Yeah. 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 It comes out really nice. So let's factor out the negative 16 T squared. Negative 16 times what gives me positive 128? Negative eight. eight. Yeah. Negative eight. So negative eight T. Oops. I keep on drawing T's that don't have little hooks. Uh, and then uh, negative six. Uh, what do I factor out here? Seven, yeah. So this is plus seven. All right, so now I'm looking for two numbers that multiply to give me positive seven and add to give, together to give me negative eight. So you divided everything by negative 16, right? I just factored out that negative 16. But you know what I could do? I could divide both sides of this equation by 16. So let me write this over here. I'm just going to bring this up and I'm going to write it again. Negative 16 times t squared minus 8t plus 7 equals 0. Divide both sides by negative 16 just for clarity. What's 0 divided by negative 16? 0. So, okay. Now I have t squared minus 8t plus 7. How does that factor? So I get this line, which is much easier to look at, right? How does that factor? Mr. Jennings, that's t minus 7 multiplied by t minus 1 equals 0. Is it 1 because 7 and 1? Yeah. Yeah. See, I need, number? yeah. So I notice that uh, I'm multiplying to get a positive number, but I'm adding to get a negative number. That means I must be multiplying two negative numbers by one another. And then... 7 is prime, so there's only one way to do it. So 7 times 1. 7 plus 1 is, is negative 8. Negative 7 plus negative 1, negative 8. So that works. Now, at what, at how many seconds will this rocket have gone up and then and be at uh, that height? Yeah, at two different times that rocket is going to be at that height. So do we have a function here? If we had two different inputs and they gave us the same output. Yeah. Sure, it's still a function. I know it's a function because um, I can write this as y equals. Yeah. Y equals the quadratic. Yes. Also, there's no problem if I can repeat an output with different inputs. That's fine. Just each input should have a unique value. When t is 1, then the output will be 112. When t is 7, the output will also be 112. And I could graph this in Desmos to check. I could also just input that value. And so I would input one there and I would say negative uh, 16 plus 128. Well, that's 112. And then I could put in seven and check that as well with my calculator and see if both work. But I'm quite confident that we're correct here. Now we could have used quadratic formula at this point, but if we didn't spot that we could divide out a 16, we would have been working with big ugly numbers. But it still would have worked. If we had just used quadratic formula at that point, it would have told us t is 7 or t is 1. Therefore, the rocket is at 112 feet at t uh, equals 7 or t 
t equals one seconds. Because this rocket goes up and then comes down again. So it's at that height twice, at two separate times. Cool. Okay, if we find that the rocket is in two places at once, then we don't have a function. But if we have, find that the rocket is in one place at two different times, it means it came there, left, and came back again. No problem. Still a function. Okay. So when we're looking at these types of questions, um, we can have three different solutions, three different situations with our quadratics. They can have no solutions or no roots. That's where the quadratic is, is hovering above or coming below hylium or coming below the x-intercept. Um, there is a situation where we have one solution and we have a situation where there's two solutions. Now, this thing here is called the discriminant. The discriminant of a quadratic involves the a, b, and c, and it's b squared minus 4ac. Yeah, that's the, that's the sheet. Yeah, that's that one. Yeah. B squared minus 4ac is called the discriminant. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oops. So this determines how many solutions that the quadratic will have. And so let's take a look at how this discriminant will predict that. If the discriminant, if the uh, discriminant is bigger than zero, b squared minus 4ac, if that's larger than zero, we will always have a quadratic that has two roots. Okay. The discriminant, which we'll indicate here by this triangle, delta, uh, if that's bigger than zero, if it is positive, we have two roots. If it is exactly equal to zero, if b squared is the same thing as 4 times a times c, then it will have one and exactly one root. And then if the d is less than zero, if b squared, if four, negative 4ac is, is, uh, cancels out and makes this b squared negative, then we have a situation where the quadratic has no solutions, okay? So what's this relationship that we're seeing between the discriminant and the number of roots of a quadratic? So that's an interesting idea. If I go to Desmos and I, uh, actually, I'm not sure how I'm going to do a slider for that. I know how I'll do a slider for that, yeah. So if I have an ax squared plus bx plus c, Okay, so this is any quadratic, and I put in some sliders. Notice this has no roots, right? As I start making C go down, you see the, uh, the roots become farther and farther apart as C goes down. As C gets bigger and bigger, what's happening there is the discriminant is getting larger and larger. The distance between the roots is getting bigger and bigger. For some value C, there's going to be exactly one root. So that's like about there. Okay. Maybe I can change my B and then get it just nice. Anyway, you get the idea, right? There's one point where there's exactly one root right about there, say, for example. There, the discriminant is zero. So the difference between the roots is now zero. They're the same thing. There's one root instead of two. That's the only situation where you can have one root. It's where the vertex is the root and it touches the x-axis. And then for bigger values of C, there's no roots. Okay. So that's an example of, uh, of this quadratic just like moving around and changing. The discriminant is changing as I change that C. So we see the discriminant here in the quadratic formula. It's the radical portion of the, of the quadratic formula. This part here is called the discriminant. When this is zero, the two roots are plus or minus zero. It tells me there's no distinction. There's nothing separating the two roots. Plus or minus zero is zero. I'm 41 plus or minus zero years old. So, um, so there you go. That's when the discriminant is zero. If the discriminant is positive, on the other hand, there is a difference between the two roots. They are separated by the discriminant. Excellent. Okay. Excellent. When the discriminant is negative, I'm taking the square root of a negative number. 
There's no real numbers that have a square root that's negative. So um, that's when I have no real roots. Those are these situations. Okay, so that's the relationship between the discriminant and the number of roots of a quadratic. So here uh, we have some examples where I want you to be able to use the discriminant to tell me how many roots these have. So here, what's the discriminant? b squared minus 4ac. So quickly work through those. And then... All right, so uh, let's take this one up. Uh, just to give you a hint, we have three examples here. One of them will have two roots, one of them will have one root, and one of them will have uh, zero root. So we, we're basically doing a, a guess and check or a match and match, and we're going to use the discriminant to do that. So let's take a look at uh, our, our method for this. So to test the number of roots, you can just use the discriminant. And by investigating that corner of the uh, quadratic formula, you can find out this information about your quadratic. So here is number A, and there's my discriminant, B squared minus 4AC. Okay. So uh, what I'm going to do is plug in my numbers, 9 minus 4 times negative 2 times 8. Negative 4 times negative 2 is positive 8. So there I have 9 plus 64. I don't even, I just stop there. I'm like, oh, the 9 plus 64, that's positive. That's going to be bigger than 0. I could tell you that's 73, but I don't need to. I just need to tell you it's positive. I just need to tell you it's bigger than 0. Therefore, this quadratic has two roots. Just check the discriminant. It's very quick. The next one, what do people find for the next one? 3x squared minus 5x plus 11. What does the discriminant look like here? Negative 5x plus 11, the second example on your sheet. D is less than 0, so it's 0 roots. Yeah, it's going to be a less than 0 because here I have negative 5 squared, 25. Negative 4 times 3 times 11, well, that's uh, 142. 142 is bigger than 25. 25 minus 142 is negative, so that's 0 is bigger than that. So because this is less than zero, because it's a negative number, I know this has zero roots. I don't need to work out exactly what the discriminant is. I just need to tell you if it's positive, negative, or zero. And that tells me the number of roots. So as soon as I know that that's zero, I, less than zero, I just stop working. Yeah, 25 minus 142 is negative, uh, on negative 117. Negative yeah. 117. 25. Yeah, anyway, it's um it's bigger than it's less than it's less than zero. So it's it's quite uh it's quite zero rooty. And then this one here has been constructed in such a way so that uh, three squared is nine, minus four times a quarter is one. So nine minus one times nine is exactly zero. So if I work out that that's exactly zero, then it has one root. Nine minus one times 9, 9 minus 9 equals 0. So when b squared equals 4ac, that means b squared minus 4ac equals 0. Therefore, it has one root. Okay. All right, so that's, uh, that's how you do those things. Uh, okay, so... That's how you find out uh, how many roots things have. So those are all of the topics for this lesson. And the work for this lesson is up on the board. So page 40, number 16, and page 49, 1, 3, 6, 8, uh, 12, and 13. So take a look at those and uh, get working. Uh, oh, the root of 54. I've been asked to do the root of 54, We're so I'll just stop the... Week? Yeah, we'll take that lesson up next week. All right, so thank you for showing up, for learning about uh, finding the roots of quadratic equations and solving quadratic equations. Just a quick review. You are finding the points where the uh, equation touches a zero. You can also use that like we did for the uh, rocket question when you are asked something like... Here is an equation of my rocket. It starts at zero, it goes up, and it comes down again. And I want to know when is it this high? I can find this and this by solving, if this is uh, like a value like 100, 
I could say, well, then f of x equals 100 and solve that for x by using quadratic formula and rearranging the equation a little bit, what we saw in the toy rocket example. Basically, what you're doing when you do that is you're translating this, this down so that you are creating a new equation where these roots match these points. And then you use the quadratic equation and solve for those.